G'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be reviewing the Sigma 150-600 contemporary lens from the perspective of a bird photographer, which is what I am. In my testing, I've taken over 10,000 images with this lens, and I'm going to share a lot of those images with you today. I'm also going to be answering a lot of the common questions that you might have. That is, how is the autofocus? How is the image quality? What does it look like at 600? Does it work on a mirrorless? How does it compare to the Tamron? The list of questions goes on and on, and I'm going to try and attempt to answer all of those in today's video. To make it a little bit easier, I've broken it into chapters, and you can see the title of the chapters at the bottom of this video, or jump down into the description if you want to jump ahead to a specific part. First, I really want to thank my wonderful subscriber, Brian, who actually reached out to me and said, Dwayne, would you be interested in trying out this lens? And I was over the moon when he offered. Now, I have had this lens for some time, and that's given me the benefit of testing it with lots of different cameras and lots of different environments and different scenarios. And I was able to capture images like this superb fairy wren. This male landed on a rock, ratted off a number of shots, and believe it or not, this was actually taken on the Canon 90D at 600 millimeters, wide open at 6.3, and at a very high ISO of 6400. So I'm going to be sharing lots of images like this throughout the video. I'm also going to make a selection of raw files available. There's a link in the description. Feel free to download them and inspect the files for yourself. Alrighty, so let's have a quick chat about the actual lens itself. It's a 150 to 600 millimeter zoom lens, which means we can shoot at 150, which is quite wide. We can turn this focus ring, it goes to 600, which brings the subject in and makes it much bigger. And it's that flexibility to change your composition and to have 600 millimeters in this handheld package that makes it very attractive to wildlife photographers. It's available in Sigma's own mount, the Nikon mount, and this Canon mount that I'm actually using today. And I know many people have adapted this to use it on their Sonys and other brands as well. In regard to its size and weight, it's pretty good considering you get 600 millimeters. It weighs around 1.8 kilos or four pounds, and it's definitely hand holdable. And I actually hand held this the majority of the time. And on the screen, you can see that it's the lightest 600 zoom on the market, but it is a little bit heavier than the Canon zooms, the 100 to 400 and the 100 to 500. So you just need to take that into consideration that you know you may need to use a monopod or a tripod if you're using it for extensive periods of time, or you do find that sort of weight hard to handle. In regards to its length, when we do go all the way to 600, you can see it is fairly long. And on the screen, you can see how it compares to the 100 to 400 and the 405.6. But when we um, add back to the 150, it's pretty favorable in comparison to, to those lenses. So you could definitely put it in your backpack, I guess, without and travel with it without too much of a problem. All right, so this lens is a variable aperture lens. What does that mean? Well, when we're at 150 millimeters, we're our widest, we have a max aperture of F5, so it's letting in quite a bit of light. And as we uh, zoom out, we get to 100, and I think it's what is it, 180 millimeters, it then goes to um, 5.6. And as we get keep going out, we get to 388 millimeters, it then goes out to 6.3. And obviously, between 388 and 600, it's at that 6.3. I actually took probably 80% of my shots um, in that 6.3 range. So the majority of the time, I was shooting with a max aperture of 6.3. And I guess that aperture of 6.3, back in the day, that was considered pretty slow. Um, especially compared to the say 2.8 or f4 primes. However, as we've seen with Canon, they've released some f11 lenses and their zooms f7.1. I guess with the more recent bodies, they can handle high ISO much, much better. We've got software that gets around it. So 6.3 probably isn't as slow as it used to be, and I didn't find it to be an issue whatsoever. So the other thing to note about the lens is the minimum focus distance is around 2.7 meters. So that's gonna determine just how close you can get and it's not gonna give you the magnification of say Canon's zoom lenses. You can get around that with an extension tube. It's a bit of a pain adding and removing extension tubes and you lose a bit of light, but it's definitely an option, say if you were to photograph insects or butterflies or something like that. So it also has Sigma's optical stabilization and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Probably the most attractive part of this lens is just its price. It's the cheapest 600 millimeter zoom lens on the market, I think. And it retails to around 899 US dollars, which really is a pretty much a bargain for a 600 millimeter lens. Um, I think you can even pick it up for around 500 second hand. So it makes it a really attractive option. And that's probably why there's so much interest in this lens. So it comes with this um, lens hood, which is plastic. It does click on there quite well. It's quite secure. We've had no issues with it whatsoever. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't come with an Arca Swiss foot like the new Tamron 150 500, which is a really nice feature. You've got to actually add the plate yourself um, to be able to fit it onto a gimbal or a tripod head or something like that. So before I show you the IQ of the lens, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know I've created a 2022 digital art calendar that's available to download 
for your desktop, your laptop, or your tablet. It features 12 images that I've taken throughout the year, many of them featured in my videos. I'm really proud of these images and I love how they look. Now, I'm happy to say that this digital calendar is available for free for my members. If you don't know what a member is, for the price of less than a cup of a coffee a month, you become a member of the channel. There's a join button under the video um, that directly supports me and helps me make these videos. Now, um, I'm also gonna make January free for everybody, so that link will be in the description. And if you just wanna buy it outright, I've made it available at the low price of $9.95 on my website. And again, there'll be a link in the description. So to download this for my members, just go to my channel on YouTube. There's actually a show perks button. Click the show perks button, scroll down, and the calendar will be listed there. There'll be a link, hit the link, and it'll download the zip file for you. So this review is gonna focus on how the lens performed in the field. You're not going to see any MTF charts. I'm not going into a lab. You can look that up online. What you will get are shots taken in the field in real world scenarios. And I believe that best represents what's possible with this lens. I'd like to start with sharing my favorite image I took with this lens. It's of a juvenile Eastern spinebill on a flowering kangaroo paw. What's your reaction? For me, I just love how it makes me feel. It just makes me smile, to be honest. I think it's the complementary colors. Um, it's the beautiful flower. And the bird's giving us a really nice pose with really good eye contact. And overall, this image just works for me. It's of interest, this shot was actually taken with the 90D at ISO 3200, and it's actually missing fine detail. In contrast, this image of a Jackie Winter is much sharper and has far more detail than the spine bill, but it's nowhere near as good as the spine bull shot. And this demonstrates that there's far more to an image than sharpness and detail. So the strength of that spine bill image is in the composition, the color, the subject matter. Yes, sharpness and IQ is important, but it's not everything. In saying that, I know many of you want to know just how sharp this lens is. I think it's important that we do realize that this lens isn't an L series prime lens, so we shouldn't expect it to have as good an image quality. But actually, I was really surprised with just the quality I was getting from this lens. And I'm going to show you some photos now which demonstrate what's capable with it. So I first decided to test the lens with this old Canon 40D. It's about 14 years old, 10 megapixels, worth about 40 bucks. So it's interesting to see what sort of shots we can get out of the setup. I did do a video with the setup and there's a link below. And here's a shot that I'll share with you. I was at a local lake and there's an Australian grebe that had chicks. I got nice and low and I was just enamored with this shot. It's just beautiful. The behavior's fantastic. The Sigma delivered, you know, above average image quality. It was sharp, there's nice background separation. And this is because I had nice light and the 600 millimeters plus the 1.6 crop actually gives us a field of view of a full frame of 960 millimeters, which is quite a lot. Made that bird nice and big and we got plenty of detail. This image also taken on the 40D is of a juvenile mass lapwing, which really shows the versatility of this lens because I was actually photographing some small dotterels and they were at 600 millimeters. This bird is much, much bigger. So I actually had to zoom out to 361 millimeters just to frame the bird. Now the light was pretty low and I was using a high ISO of 1600, but again, the image quality and the sharpness is excellent. It's pretty incredible how this combo performed considering its cost. So I also extensively tested this lens on the 90D. Again, I've released a video using that kit. And again, I was really happy with the results that I was getting. This time, a beautiful red cap robin landed on this um, rock with a little bit of dried moss. I just love this perky pose. We've got nice eye contact. Again, detail is excellent. Good separation with the background. Just overall, a really, really great image. Now I also tested the lens on this Canon R5, this mirrorless body, and I'll talk much more about that later about its autofocus, etc. I just want to have a look at the types of shots I was getting from this camera, and boy were they pretty sharp. Now to show you how sharp it is, let's have a look at a couple of portrait shots. First one is of this Australian magpie in nice direct sunlight. We can see the details around the eye and the feathers are just fantastic, and it shows just how sharp this lens can be also demonstrates just how shallow 600 millimeters is. As you can see, the end of the bill is completely out of focus. So we've got a very narrow depth of field. Uh, the second shot is actually of a juvenile galah. What a beautiful bird with those nice pink feathers. I really like this pose with the crest up. We had nice morning light. And I was, again, I was impressed with the detail. It's just super sharp. Believe it or not, I actually took this shot in Canon's 1.6 crop mode because I'd actually forgotten to turn it off. So this image is already a pretty big crop and it holds up pretty well. I also decided to stop the lens down to test it at say F9 on the R5. Had a couple of fairy wrens jumping around on a rock 
taken a number of shots and unfortunately the female sort of got a bit of motion blur because it's moving too fast and it's a bit distracting so I've decided to crop into a portrait of the male onside the rock and again held up really really well. Now a lot of people are probably interested in oh, well, what's the cropping ability you know what's the detail like after you crop heavily. I was actually in the field photographing some robins when I noticed a uh, black faced cuckoo shrike land in a tree fairly far away and again I had um, what was I at 600 millimeters so I've just turned the lens up I've captured focused on the bird in the tree I've taken a few shots got back to the computer and the bird is actually pretty small and I'll show you this uh, image now and maybe just have a guess what percentage of the original frame do you think this is is it 40 percent is it 30 percent it's actually only 25% of the original photo. I think that's a full credit to the R5, it's 45 megapixels, and the ability of the lens to even get that sharp shot. Now this was taken at f9, and many of you are probably wondering, well, what's it like shot wide open at 6.3? So first up is this shot of a female superb fairy wren. What a nice perky pose it's giving us. It's calling away, shot at 403 millimeters at 6.3, and as you can see, nice and sharp. So I also took plenty of shots at 600, 6.3. This shot of the raven was in direct sunlight. It was taken at ISO 1600 on the R5. And I have to admit, I was slightly surprised with just how sharp it was wide open. I just wasn't expecting that. But again, this shows just how important light is and how close you are to the subject and getting these details. Now, what aperture did I mostly use? I've actually checked my Lightroom um, data for all the shots I took. And as I mentioned, 10,000 shots. And as you can see on the screen, the majority of them were actually taken at 7.1, with some at f8, but I took a lot at 6.3 or wide open. It shows that over time, I've actually been quite confident using it wide open when I didn't have adequate light, and I didn't really have too many dramas with the image quality that I was receiving, which is a good sign. So another good question is, well, how did it perform in low light? And this is gonna heavily depend on the camera you're using. If you've got a really old APS-C body, the higher that ISO goes, <laughs> the worse that quality is going to be. But I actually did use it on the 90D, which is an APS-C body by Canon, and I pushed the ISO all the way up to 6400, which is really high, and I had some dusky wood swallows um, perched on a side of a tree, and I took some shots, and when we zoom in, we can see that there's quite a lot of noise, and the image quality has definitely suffered, but the bird is in focus. And, you know, 10 years ago, I would have just deleted this image, but thankfully now we have software such as DxO Pure Raw. You run it through that, you process the photo, and you end up with an image like this, which to me is perfectly acceptable, and I would use this image. Now, if you want to download DxO Pure Raw, the link in the description, if you click on that link, it obviously supports the channel. I do get an affiliate for that, so I do appreciate it. It's well worth checking out. And here's another shot taken at ISO 6400 on the 90D. This time the beautiful fairy wren again. Great pose. This one actually holds up a lot better than the previous one. And that's mainly because we've got a nice light background and we actually just did have a lot more ambient light than the previous one. The previous one was in the forest, whereas this fairy wren's outside. So we just had better light and as such, we had less noise in the image. Overall, I can confidently say that if you get this lens, you will be able to take shots such as the ones that I shared nice and sharp with plenty of detail. I even captured one of Australia's ugliest birds, the noisy fryer bird with this lens and it came up looking pretty good. Okay, now I think it's important for full disclosure that I didn't just take nice shots. I took plenty of stinkers, I took plenty of poor shots, plenty of out of focus shots, uh, missed focus, soft motion blur, you name it. Any wildlife photographer who doesn't take soft shots is lying. Um, so I'm gonna just share a couple of those with you. So the first shot I wanna share with you is a bla this black faced cuckoo shrike that was in a tree a long ways off. And as we zoom in, you can see that the image falls apart and it's actually a little bit blurry. Now, some of us may be quick to blame the lens in this scenario, but this is purely user error. It's all my fault. The shutter speed was just too low. I was using, what was I using? One 500th of a second, which, you know, it isn't that low, but due to how much I shake, uh, I need quite high shutter speeds. And this shot has motion blur because of me shaking. The IS obviously wasn't able to assist me in this scenario, but because I shoot in bursts, the next image was actually sharp, as you can see. And because we're of that distance, we don't quite have the image quality we're after. But I think this highlights that the majority of the soft shots or poor shots or poor photos I took weren't the fault of the lens, they were the fault of the photographer. And unfortunately, I suspect that's the majority of the cases when we get these bad shots. And here's another shot that I stuffed up. The bird is completely out of focus because I've accidentally focused on the background. 
In fact, the grass in the background is pretty sharp. Now I did refocus onto the bird and you can see that the next shot with the bird in focus is actually sharp. Basically the poor shots that I took were a combination of user error, AF issues, camera issues, they weren't actually the fault of the lens. In fact, I have actually complete confidence in this lens that if you shoot in nice light and you get the bird in focus, you should be able to capture shots like this red cap robin. And I asked you the question, would you be happy taking this shot on a $900 lens? It wasn't just birds that I photographed. I did use my old 5D Mark IV and photographed some beautiful butterflies. And as you can see, again, the image came out really, really well, and I'm very happy with this image. So basically, I was able to take nice shots on every camera that I used, and I believe that's a credit to this lens. Let's talk about the incredible zoom range of this lens. As I mentioned, it goes from 150 to 600 millimeters, and on an APS-C body, we can go all the way to 960 full frame equivalent, which is pretty amazing. Being an external zoom means that when we turn the focus ring, the lens extends as such, and the downside to these external zooms is the throw of this uh, zoom means I need to probably turn it twice to go from 150 to 600. So one, two turns. Whereas on an internal zoom, such as the Sony 200 to 600, that's one turn. That goes from 150 to 600 really quickly and is a bit of an advantage, I must admit. Now the lens does have a lock on it, so you can lock your focal length. I must admit I never used this feature, but say you wanted to stay at a particular focal length, you could use that. Now a photo at 150 millimeters is gonna look a lot different to a photo at 600. And you can see on the screen, as we zoom from 150 to 600, this little toy owl just goes from being quite small to being huge. So you can see that the range there is enormous. And there were a few times while I was taking photos where this really saved me, to be honest. I was photographing this little yellow footed antichinus, which is a, looks like a little rat, a little mammal. It's, uh, it was running up uh, a log and running towards me and 600 millimeters was just too much. So I had to actually zoom out and what was I at? 267 millimeters to get this shot. If I'd had my prime, I would have missed this shot for sure. And the other obvious question about the focal length of this lens is, well, how different is 400 millimeters from 600? 400 being uh, the max focal length of the Canon uh, 100 to 400. So that's an obvious comparison. Well, on the screen, you can see just what a difference it is. We've got this uh, toy Galar. On the left, we have 400 millimeters, well, 403. And on the right, we have 600 millimeters. And at 600, the bird's just much, much bigger. And when we zoom in, you can really see the difference in detail that's captured at 600 millimeters. So of interest, Canon zooms actually start at 100, which is actually a lot wider than 150. You know, 150 is 50% narrower, which is actually quite big in the field. And if you take more habitat tile shots, you'll actually really benefit from 100 over the 150. Okay, the next thing I wanna chat about are teleconverters. And people love to ask me about teleconverters. And surprisingly, this lens can accept a 1.4 teleconverter on a DSLR, even though the max aperture is F9. However, don't do it. <laughs> the image quality and the autofocus is terrible. I actually did put the 1.4 on my 5D4 and it was just abysmal to be honest. It was just wasn't usable. I just wouldn't do it. I'd just crop the image and post afterwards. However, these mirrorless bodies, they focus a little bit differently and they don't need as much light as the old DSLRs did to autofocus. So I've actually used Canon's extenders on the R5 and I actually used it two times. So it became, what was that? That becomes a 1200 F13, which is a bit ridiculous, but the autofocus worked, the eye autofocus worked and I was able to take some shots. Now, if we have a look at this shot of this red cap robin, it actually scrubbed up pretty well. And I was really, really surprised. However, don't go out, rush out and get converters thinking you're gonna use them all the time. This was taken in the very best of light. And you know, it definitely slows down the autofocus and you will run into IQ issues because you're gonna to have to use a really high ISO or a really low shutter speed. So definitely usable if you wanna, you know, if you're scoping or for whatever reason you need 1200 millimeters focal length, you can use a two times and a Canon two times too, which is pretty cool. So in relation to the frames per second on the mirrorless body, at first I didn't think I was getting the full 12 frames per second. And then I quickly realized that on these Canon bodies, if you've got Wi-Fi on, it doesn't give you the full 12, go figure. So you turn off Wi-Fi, you will get the full 12 frames per second mechanical shutter. And of course you'll get 20 in electronic. So it definitely will give you 12 frames per second on this Canon mirrorless body. So the lens has optical stabilization or image stabilization, um, and you can adjust it on the side of the lens here. Now it definitely works um, at 
keeping the viewfinder steady when you're hand holding it. But I think it's important to understand you've got 600 millimeters of focal length. So ideally the old rule of thumb is you should have 600th of a second shutter speed as well. Obviously you can take photos lower than that, but you will increase your risk of motion blur even with IS attached. Now I did take lots of shots at really low shutter speeds and you can see this anti kinus was actually taken at an 80th of a second, which is, which is pretty cool, it's nice and sharp, but this was followed by soft, soft shots. So in a burst of shots, only a handful of them are sharp. So I would never recommend shooting at really slow shutter speeds for wildlife, only if you have no light whatsoever definitely bump up that shutter speed. So Sigma also advises to turn the IS off when it's on a tripod. And I must admit, if you leave it on, the, the image in the viewfinder just moves on its own and actually jumps around a bit and it's just not usable. So you have to switch it off. And that's a bit of a pain to be honest, because on my Canon lenses, I just leave IS on because I'm pretty lazy and there's no degradation of quality. I don't have any issues with it, with it whatsoever. So, you know, if it's on a tripod, IS off. If you pick it up, you've got to turn it back on. It's a minor inconvenience, but that's just the way it is. Now let's have a look at what the footage looks like hand holding the Canon RF 100 to 500 on the R5. And next to it is the Sigma 150 to 600 on the R5, both with their own image stabilization and you can make up your own mind which one is working better. So the lens does have a focus limiter, most lenses will have this, and this is to stop the focus hunting through a huge range. You know, if you're doing bird and flight and it's never gonna come within three meters, you might as well not have the lens looking at that. So you can change it to what you like. And I believe you can also, using the dock, set it up to your own custom um, focus limit, which is pretty cool. And I believe you just set it to the custom function down here. So another thing to mention is just calibration. If you use a DSLR, you can get the Sigma dock and it will help calibrate the lens to your camera. It's probably best practice to do this if you're keeping this lens long term to prevent that front or rear focusing issue that you might have on a DSLR. Now I must admit I didn't actually calibrate this lens, I didn't have the dock and I used it on a number of DSLRs and it just worked straight out of the box which is fortunate but if you are having consistently soft shots and it's just focusing in front or back behind that's a calibration issue, get the dock and you should be able to sort that out. And of course, if you've got a mirrorless body, you don't have to worry about lens calibration anymore because all the focusing is done on the sensor. Okay, it's time to talk about the autofocus performance of this lens. And this is where it falls behind the more expensive lenses. The AF definitely works. I captured lots of shots. However, it's a little bit inconsistent and a little bit slow, which led to me getting quite a few soft shots and actually missed opportunities. It's just a little bit slower than say the Canon 405.6 or 100 to 400. So when I first used it on the 40D, it did hunt quite a bit. Maybe it's because of the camera and how old it is and the autofocus system. But you can see when I was photographing Grebe, it's done well capturing the action, but then for whatever reason, it actually jumps onto the background. And then it pulls past the birds focusing on the water before going back to the birds. And then it loses the birds and goes back onto the background. So you sort of just that inconsistent focus sort of meant I missed quite a few shots. But I must admit, once it found the subject and it locked onto it, it did pretty well. I next want to share some shots with you of just how difficult it can be to achieve focus when photographing birds and wildlife. I want to share a burst of shots of this noisy miner on a kangaroo paw. This was taken on the 90D and the Sigma. I had the noisy miner land on this kangaroo paw, which actually has a lot of flowers. I've used single point focus and tried to put the focus point on the bird, but it's actually locked onto the flower just in front of the bird. And as soon as the bird moves behind the flower, that shallow depth of field at 600 means the bird is now soft. The focus point was unable to see the bird and I tried to refocus, but I actually ended up on the flowers behind the bird. As you can see in this sequence of shots, the camera and lens got it wrong a lot more than it got it right. But I did end up with a usable shot, as you can see on the screen, and this is probably more to do with luck than anything else. But these are just some of the struggles that you'll encounter, especially with Canon DSLRs with this lens in certain scenarios. It's just very difficult to latch onto that bird. Now, a lot of this is user error and the situation is very difficult, but I would have expected it to do a little better than this. Here's another example where I simply couldn't keep up with the subject. This time, a small yellow-footed antichinus was running towards me and I sort of simply couldn't track the little mammal quick enough and all the shots were missed focus completely. There were a number of factors here. My shutter speed was too low, my focal length, I had too much focal length as the subject was just too big, and I was asking too much of the DSLR in this scenario. And here's a series of dusky wood swallow shots, shot in very low light using ISO 6400, slow shutter speeds, basically the hardest conditions for an autofocus system to operate. And as you can predict, 
it actually really struggled in this scenario. The bird starts off in focus, we get a few shots, but we quickly lose focus, and then when we do get focus back, for some reason it's actually front focused a bit. As you can see, part of the tree in front of the bird is sharp, but the bird isn't. We do eventually get back to the bird being sharp, but this focus was inconsistent, it was happening all the time, where it was just moving around, like you'd lock on, take some burst of shots and then it would lose it and get back to it. So even in nice light I had that inconsistency and you can see with this Jackie Winter, very nice light but we shot in bursts, we had sharp, sharp, soft, soft, back to sharp, back to soft and this pattern was pretty common and unfortunately was pretty predictable when I was using this lens. And I want to stress again that the majority of these shots are probably my fault and not the fault of the lens. I'm just sharing with you that the struggles that I had and the types of shots that I got, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this sort of thing with your own lenses and your own setup. But I definitely notice a distinct change in keepers when I go from, say, the Sigma to the RF100 to 500 and the R5. And that's probably a credit to the new technology, the better IS, the better focus of that lens. So this, whilst gear is not important, this more expensive gear allows us to get more shots in tougher conditions which is why you pay all that extra money. Now to overcome some of these inconsistent autofocus issues, what I do is I actually, as I've mentioned, shoot in bursts. So always shoot in lots of bursts. The photos don't cost you anything, just take lots of photos. And I'm always recalibrating my focus or resetting focus. So I'll take a burst of shots with the focus and then I'll purposely refocus. And I might even focus somewhere else, come back onto it. This is what I used to do on my 5D4, um, just to ensure that one of these bursts, one, some of these images are gonna be sharp. Because if you just, um, if it's not focused correctly on the bird and you just don't refocus, all those shots are going to be soft. So it's much better to just continually refocus, take bursts. That way you can guarantee that some of your shots in your session will be sharp. Now I know many of you are probably interested whether this lens works on the R5 and it definitely does. The AF definitely works. We get the IAF autofocus, which is groundbreaking, which is one of the reasons to buy these cameras. As you can see, it just sticks to that Jackie Winter's eye and it just, I can move it around, recompose. I don't have to move the joystick. The IAF just sticks to that eye and tracks it all around the place, which is fantastic. We don't get the full 100% viewfinder coverage like we do on say my 100 to 500. Um, and you can see that white box. That's the only area that the autofocus will work, which is still a lot more than a DSLR. And of interest, the RF 600 and 800 F11s have the same restricted viewfinder. So it's not just the Sigma lens. Some of the Canon lenses um, don't use the full coverage either. Unfortunately, I still encountered the inconsistent um, focus with the R5. And I also encountered another issue, which I shared in my previous video with pulsing or focus shifting, which I'll talk about soon. But just to show you this um, inconsistent focus, here's a data that I captured in really, really good light. We had a high shutter speed, of I think what, 12 50th of a second. So we shouldn't get too much motion blur. And I engaged the IAF, locks onto the eye, and I started shooting. When I reviewed the shots, I was surprised with just how many were out of focus and soft. So let's have a look at what I'm talking about. So we start off nice and sharp, and I've got the IAF, the servo engaged, and we go from sharp, then soft, then sharp, and then soft. When it was sharp, it was really sharp, and when it was soft, it was really soft. So a bit of Jekyll and Hyde in regards to the autofocus on this lens. And as we can see with this Raven, the lens and camera got confused, even when the eye is pretty obvious. In the first shot, the focus is well behind the eye on the shoulder. The next shot, it's jumped forward to the bill, and then it finally gets on the eye and it's super sharp. And then the very next shot is back onto the shoulder. However, the very next bird that I photograph is this Pukeko, or Swamp Hen, and it's walking through the grass, it's got a little baby, and the auto eye just stays on the bird the whole time, and I managed to get lots and lots of shots, and especially this shot, which I really like. So, you know, I'm glad it worked in this scenario, but it just went to show the frustrations that I had, that sometimes it worked perfectly, and then other times it didn't. Now, I wanted to look at this pulsing issue a little bit more. What I mean by that is on the screen, you can see this butterfly, and it's going in focus, out of focus, in focus, out of focus. It's, it's literally pulsing. Now it's, it's apparent that this in this scenario we've got a bit of wind blowing around, we've got a flower in front of the butterfly, it's pretty tough and we probably should expect the autofocus to struggle. So what I've done is I've actually set up um, my toy budgie and which isn't moving and again we had this focus issue where it was going in and out of focus. Now I showed that in my last video and you reached out to me, many of you reached out and said are you using the latest firmware on the lens and do you have the 1.5 firmware on the R5? Well, I actually went for a drive. I drove out to the owner of the lens, Brian's house, and he has the dock. We've attached the lens to the dock, and it was the latest firmware. I've loaded 1.5 on the camera, so everything is current as of today. 
Um, and so what we decided to do was let's try it. So we went into Brian's backyard. I've set up my toy owl in his bird bath, but unfortunately it still had that focus pulsing even with all the updated firmware. And I don't know what's causing it. But of interest, um, Brian actually also owned two other Sigma lenses. And the first one we tested was his 500 f4, which is a really nice lens. So we decided to try that. And I've actually put the two times on it to make the bird much, much bigger. And as we can see, no pulsing. So we did not get the pulsing with the 500 f4, even with the two times. Now, he also has the Sigma 120 to 300 2.8, another really good lens, expensive lens. We've put that on, put the two times on, and again, we didn't get the pulsing issue. So it was only with that contemporary lens that we got the pulsing issue. And judging by the comments in previous videos, it appears maybe some of Sigma's contemporary lenses, some of Canon's older lenses, it seems to be very lens specific, this pulsing issue. And again, I don't know what's going on. It's just a miscommunication between the lens and the body. Now I do have some hope that Sigma will address this in a firmware update, hopefully. They did release a firmware update for that 500, so I'm hopeful that they'll do it for this lens as well and fix that pulsing. I reached out to Sigma and unfortunately they didn't get back to me to let me know what's going on there. Maybe if you know, you could let us know in the comments. So I'm gonna share with you how to get around this pulsing issue. In servo mode, that means that we're constantly auto-focusing. When we hold down the button, it's constantly checking and changing focus because it wants to track the subject. If we just simply change to single shot, which you can do just via a button, you can just push a button, program it on your camera, go to single shot, you focus, and then it's in focus and you take your shots as you can see on the camera. Now, this takes away the amazing tracking ability of the camera, but it will enable you to photograph butterflies or anything when, if you do have this pulsing issue. Just remember you lose the eye tracking with the single shot on. So if you do then go back to birds, ensure you turn it back to servo because you don't want to miss out on the amazing auto eye feature of this camera. I know many of you will be interested how this lens performs in bird and flight because that's pretty difficult. So I made an effort to drive all the way out to a lake where I knew there'd be some silver gulls. At least that is something I can photograph flying. So I've actually set up by the water's edge and sure enough, it didn't take too long before I had some silver gulls flying past. And as you can see, once the lens can find the bird, it then locks onto it. The auto eye sticks to the eye and we just take shots and track the bird as it flies. And we can see that I took this shot almost full frame in nice light. We've got amazing detail. The bird looks fantastic and overall very, very happy. However, I decided to challenge the lens a bit and I saw some galahs and some little corellas. They were sort of flying out from a tree and they move and fly in all sorts of way, weird ways. And I'll be honest that I struggled to pick them up. The lens was just a little bit slow to find the subject and then lock onto it. By the time I'd locked onto it, the bird had sort of moved and it was a bit of a challenge. I must admit my skills aren't probably what they need to be in regards to bird and flight and something I need to practice. However, I did get some shots, but ultimately the birds were just a little bit too far away. And when we crop them in heavily, they don't have the detail I'd like, but it does show you that the bird is sharp, the pose is good, and it definitely works for bird and flight. Now I did actually venture into a sort of a wetland, swamp, bushland area, because I could hear lots of birds. And when you're in the bush with these cockatoos, it's not a pleasant sound. It's raucous, it's loud, and you know there's plenty of birds about. And I spotted these cockatoos actually feeding on these um, like water lilies or they're feeding on something in the middle of this uh, little uh, wetland. And there was a lot of shadows about. So there was light, there was shadows, so there's dark areas. And the birds were flying through this light and flying through the shadow. And I was on the water's edge and I thought, that'd be pretty cool to try and photograph the bird as it's flying into the light. So I shoot in manual mode and I've set the exposure for the whites of the birds because if I was in auto exposure, because of how dark the scene is, the camera would probably try and brighten the entire image, which would blow out the whites, and we probably wouldn't have got this shot. So what I ended up doing, focused on the whites, saw some of the birds were coming into land, and there was a big sulfur crest of cockatoo coming to land, so I've picked it up, I've locked onto it, the birds flowing in as it's coming down to land on these lilies, got a heap of shots and didn't think too much of it. And it wasn't until I sort of got back to the computer and I noticed and I went, oh, that's interesting. The background's really dark, but the bird's in the light and it gives this, this weird, unusual look. So this is the shot I was able to capture and I was really impressed with it. It's something different. It's not something my usual style. I'd love to know whether you like it. Let me know in the comments. Um, you know, it's just something different, I suppose, and not something you'll get every time. 
Now you're probably wondering, well, what does the raw file look like? Well, here's the raw file. Um, as you can see, the background is dark, but I did do some processing. I did darken those dark areas even more to accentuate that difference. And as you can see, we've got the benefit of the R5 again, where I was able to crop it because the bird was a little bit too left in the frame. Even with that crop, we still ended up with a massive file that I'm very, very happy with. Here's another burst of shots of a cockatoo flying past me in the river. And as you can see, the background's changing all the time, yet the focus just sticks to the bird. Now, I'm not that happy with any of these shots, but it shows you exactly how well the autofocus can work once it locks onto the subject. Okay, let's talk about value and how it compares to other lenses. At 900 bucks, this lens is a bargain. The type of shots you can get at 600 millimeters for 900 US new is is amazing and the fact you can pick this up for 500 second hand um, sort of shows that anyone wanting to get into wildlife photography could potentially get this lens and get shots exactly like I've shown in today's video. Yes the AF is a bit of a bummer but I still got nice shots. Um, how does it compare to the Tamron 150 to 600 which is its obvious competitor and I have tested that lens and I did do a review and if I'm being honest they're almost identical they're very very similar. The Sigma is possibly a little bit sharper. So in regards to Canon lenses that compete with this, the obvious one is the 405.6, which I've reviewed and I've had this forever. I'm a little bit biased towards this lens. Um, second hand, they're probably very similar price. This is only 400 millimeters. This lens is faster, it's 5.6. It focuses faster, it's possibly a touch sharper, but it does not have IS and that's a pretty big deal. And uh, the minimum focus distance of 3.5 is not that good and it's 400 millimeters. I probably wouldn't get the 100 to 400 version one that had some softness issues out at 400 and it was inconsistent in its build quality however the 100 to 400 mark ii beautiful lens if you can afford that lens i would pick that lens every time it's sharp the autofocus is consistent the is is amazing it works perfectly on the mirrorless bodies let's take a look at some comparison shots between the sigma 150 to 600 and the canon 100 to 400. so i've got out my toy budgie I've gone to a distance of 8.6 meters or 28 feet, so a fair distance, and I've shot both lenses wide open. As we can see, the Sigma on the right has that big reach advantage and that extra 200 millimeters has really increased the size of the bird. Now, if we zoom in on the 100 to 400 to the same framing, they do look very, very similar. But when we zoom into 100%, we can see just how much more detail is captured on the Sigma. Now, when we put a 1.4 extender on the Canon, it gives us 560 F8. You can see that the images are similar, but I've actually stopped the Canon down to F10 to increase sharpness, and this does require a lot more light than the 6.3 Sigma. And the 90D AF with a teleconverter, um, it's not ideal. You do get a lot of focus points, but it just works so much better on the mirrorless body. I'm not that keen using uh, 1.4 converters at F8 on, on DSLRs, but it is definitely an option. If we jump onto the mirrorless body, it does take teleconverters much better. And as you can see, we can now use the two times with the 100 to 400 and gives us an 800 F11. And it actually looks pretty well. But remember, we can also use that two times on the Sigma and that makes it obviously that 1200, but we do encounter some IQ issues and the autofocus issues that I mentioned earlier. I think what that little comparison highlighted is just how uh, well the 600 millimeters performs on this lens. All right, so what lens would I personally buy? If I had a DSLR and I had say less than $1,000 and I was just photographing water birds or setups, I actually think I would buy the Sigma lens now. Um, the 600 millimeters, the IS, the image quality, um, it's pretty good. However, if I was doing a lot of action and I was doing bird and flight, I would actually go back and reach more than my 405.6. It's just, um, the autofocus is just much better on this lens. It's just a little bit faster, it's really sharp, it just lacks that 200 millimeters. But for bird and flight, that's not as much of an issue. So it's sort of, there's no one perfect lens is there for every situation. But um, I'd definitely probably choose the Sigma the majority of the time and this one for action. Now, if I had a little bit more money, I would definitely go with the Canon 100 to 400 version two. That lens is super sharp. Um, the autofocus is consistent, works great on the mirrorless bodies. So I'd definitely probably pick that. And now if, we, if I had already had a mirrorless body, so if I had an R6 or an R5 and I was looking for a wildlife lens, would I buy this lens? Um, it's a tricky one. Due to the autofocus issues, possibly not. Uh, I may look at, say, getting the RF 800 F11, just for that extra reach and it works. The IS is great. Um, and I may even look at that RF 100 to 400. I haven't tested it yet, but having those two options, having that zoom and the prime 
um, with the RF mount would probably be the way I'd go. Now, if they released an RF mount of this lens, then yeah, sure, I'd probably go with that um, if they got over that autofocus issue. It's something to look forward to, I suppose. In regards to the Nikon mount, obviously Nikon have the 200 to 500. I haven't used that. Please feel free to share in the comments your thoughts on that lens. But excitingly, Nikon are about to release a 200 to 600 affordable zoom lens, similar to the Sony one um, for their mirrorless body. I suspect that lens will be very impressive. Uh, for Sony, as I just mentioned, their 200 to 600 is amazing. If you can save up and buy that lens, I would be buying it. They also have the Tamron 150 to 500 for the Sony mount, and that lens is superior to this one. It's sharp, it's consistent, it's a beautiful lens. Now, I did actually have a chat to the lens's owner, Brian, when he was here on my property, and I asked him why did he buy the lens and what did he think of the lens? So I'm here with Brian and Brian kindly lent me his Sigma 150 to 600 to try out. So I'm really grateful for that. So thanks, Brian. No, no problem. Um, I thought it'd be a good idea just to ask Brian why he bought the lens and what he likes about it and what he doesn't like about it. So I guess the first thing, Brian, was um, what do you like about the lens? What do you like about it? Uh, well, I like the weight. It's it's nice and light. It's easy to carry around. Being a, a zoom is good, but I needed a lens that had a bit more reach than my 300. Okay, yep, sure. Its quality is really good. Yep. Um, I've got the 300 uh, f2.8 and the image quality is equal to that. The only drawback I, I, I found with it is uh, um, autofocus in low light okay. is uh, it does slow down quite a bit. Interesting that this is probably the most affordable uh, zoom lens on the market yet uh, it seems to pr yep. produce some really good images. Uh, which it is... does. I, I'm, I was really quite surprised actually okay. how good the images were out of it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and I look forward to yeah. testing it out. No and, worries. Um, look forward to the results. All right. Thanks, Brian, again for lending me the lens. Look, I'd love to hear from anybody who owns this lens. Please feel free to comment and share your experiences. Potential um, buyers of this lens love to hear from people who ever have it, not just YouTubers like me. So please leave your comments and your experiences because it's really, really helpful and really, really um, beneficial to everybody. All right, so after over 10,000 images, multiple cameras, multiple sessions, I can happily say that I'm very happy with how this lens performed. What is obvious to me though, after using this lens extensively and using lots of other lenses is, as I mentioned at the start of this video, there's way more to wildlife photography and good shots than just the gear. Gear helps, but I highly encourage you to master the, the light, getting close to your subject, getting low, um, shutter speed, your settings. Just get out there and practice. If you get your skills up out in the field, you're gonna get really nice shots, even with some really old gear. So I highly encourage you to just get out there and enjoy yourself. And the more you practice, the more that you do it, the better your shots will get. So I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button. What that means is YouTube will recommend my video to other people, which definitely helps me. If you wanna see my videos pop up when you open up YouTube on your homepage, you hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything, just means my videos are gonna be popped up when you open up YouTube. And again, thanks to all my members that support the channel. If you're not aware, for the price of less than a cup of coffee a month, you can support the channel directly, which helps me to create videos like this. And you can get that digital calendar for free. Um, I really do appreciate the support. I wish everyone a Merry Christmas if you're celebrating Christmas and uh, hopefully I'll get another video out before the new year. But thanks again, take care and see you later.